I'm turning to Mr. Johnston, and after that I will go to Mr. Sano. So we will continue on the U.S. Thank for a you. while. I'll, I'll speak before. from here. Sorry? I, I, I'll speak from here. Yeah, I'm no problem. You can be seated. That's uh, perfect. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Is it on? Okay. Thanks very much. That, that was uh, quite a compelling presentation, uh, Stuart. I mean, I, I think uh, that it was very, very insightful. Uh, I'm going to deal with five points <clears throat> very briefly. What are consequences of the Trump administration accomplishments? Um, I remember Thierry de Montbrial actually in uh, Korea recently spoke of accomplishments, all of which were negatives, but uh, that was sort of Stuart's speech too, for better or for worse, it was a realistic uh, assessment. <clears throat> and also, I want to speak to, I've got here my computer, I want to speak to the future of international trade with, without the USA, which has been discussed here. By the way, all these are drawn from the sessions to which I participated or listened to. The third is escape from the North Korea dilemma without denuclearization. The fourth is pessimistic conclusions from the energy and climate change breakout session. I didn't hear the report, but I did participate in the session. And finally, I want to raise a, a serious challenge on the educational front in the 21st century, which was touched upon as well in one of the sessions. Going back to the question of consequences of Trump and his accomplishments, he's already inflicted serious and I think lasting damage on the global role of the United States. And the post uh, war melting out of architecture, which so many people labored so hard over so many years, led by the United States, he's put that in jeopardy. He's trying to take it further, as uh, Stuart has already pointed out. And on the shape of geopolitical uh, evolution. Now, I asked Stuart whether Trump basically doesn't always understand the consequences of his actions. That's my perception as a non-American but watching it. And the same, this is an example of, in fact, you came back and said, well, if, if a lot of companies object, a lot of things happen, he may change and he may get a deal on another basis, <coughs> which is an example of what I mean. For example, Ford Motor has said that it's going to cost him a billion dollars. Pepsi-Cola, how much? I don't know. And you would have thought that he would have learned from the imposition of tariffs on steel by, by the Bush administration, but apparently he didn't. Now, uh, the other one, that's an example I read the other day. Uh, Trump has th was thinking or was convinced that we should, he should put, uh, for, forbid visas to Chinese students coming to America. Now, we haven't heard a lot about that since, and maybe it's because it was pointed out to him that those students are contributing $19 billion a year at least to the United States educational systems and the communities in which they are operating. That's what I mean. He doesn't understand the consequences of it. We heard a very interesting comment from uh, both the uh, Chinese representative here, that was, uh, sorry, I've got it here, and, and the, um, Mr. Wang and Igor Jurgens from, uh, from Russia, when they said, well, there are good things happening for us because of Trump. The United States is essentially withdrawing from its leadership in the world stage. That means that there's a real opportunity to fill that vacuum, and that's what China I think thoroughly intends to do, which is another unintended consequence of perhaps his uh, isolationism or protectionism. Bear in mind that China was the largest economy in the world in 1820, and predictions have suggested that it would again be the largest economy in 2020. That may be slowed up a bit, but it's already, the last one I looked at, which was two years old, it's at 11 trillion, the United States is 17, and it's growing, it'll continue to grow. It'll be the largest economy. What are the consequences of that in terms of setting rules for international trade, for finance? There's going to be a move towards China as, as the United States uh, withdraws, banditing its, uh, its uh, positions. So I think the, um, the issue on trade, uh, which we heard about, uh, I wonder whether if he continues with his, with his protectionist policies, insists on bilateral deals, because his idea of making America great is to try to make everybody else less great. And, and he, that's why he does like multilateralism, because when you're in multilateralism, you're dealing with a, with a majority uh, which is not the United States. And uh, even the old regime looked at, uh, uh, even the Republicans under <coughs> Bush, I think, looked at the United States as the 800-pound gorilla in trade negotiations. So they always wanted bilateral, but they often, more often did, uh, wanted, sorry, they wanted bilateral, not, uh, not multilateral. And that's continuing. Even on the negotiation on NAFTA, you'll note that they uh, 
took Mexico aside and did a separate deal with Mexico in order to bludgeon Canada into accepting the deals that they'd hammered out with Mexico. So I think that's what we're up against. So I wonder if it's possible that that can be countered. Also, Europe has a key role to play here. The European, the European Customs Union, uh, consisting of 28 countries, and the largest market, the, the European market is uh, over 400 million people, even without Brexit. And if they can come together with a coherent policy in one voice, they will also be an 800-pound gorilla. And so you would have at least another uh, in the ring, along with China. So that may happen. I, I know that Kamal Dervish didn't think so. He thought that uh, the United States had to be part of a, of a multilateral free trade agreement. Maybe we'll come around to that. That would be good. Now, let me just say something about North Korea, that dilemma without the denuclearization. Both in Korea and at this conference, uh, we, we hear essentially that there's a pretty broad consensus that, that Kim Jong uh, is not going to give up his nuclear weapons. That's the only card he's got. Uh, so what's the alternative? Well, the alternative, I think many people believe, is not to impose more sanctions. I think President uh, Moon is probably on the right track. It's about time that strategy changed. And, and uh, they've never worked in the past. I mean, you put on sanctions, they don't really affect the, the uh, governing class in, in North Korea. I think we went back to the, the time of the joint declaration signed by Kim Jong-un and Kim Jong-il, which was uh, June 2000. And look what happened in the aftermath of that. Kaesong Park, more trade, more investment from South Korea, more jobs for North Koreans. Uh, there's many people like the former Minister of Unification, Ling Dong On, who thinks, oh, Ron, who thinks that the way we should go. Uh, get investment in North Korea won't happen unless we know a lot more about the economy, and that's why I think someone has to do the OECD, the World Bank, the IMF, or independence, someone has to do some kind of uh, Let's get some tr transparency to this so we know what the North, <coughs> North Korean economy can do and how it can develop. It, develop. On climate change, I continue to be extremely pessimistic. I've been in this game for a long time. Stuart was at like Kyoto. He remembers he was negotiating binding agreements. Paris Accord is wonderful, except that it's not binding. And not only is it not binding, but even if the national objectives, which countries have filed, saying this is what we're going to do, even if they all did that, it would not meet the, uh, the bar set by the scientific community, the IPCC. In other words, we would not be able to basically get, stay under two degrees and 4.5 uh, parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. And on top of that, we are now faced with challenges of methane, which are very serious and have not really been discussed very much, but it's something like 30 times or more powerful than, than CO2 as a greenhouse gas. So I. Frankly, we've been watching this for decade after decade after decade. Surely the answers have to be not more advocacy. It has to be technology and it also adaptation it has to be looked at very seriously. From just look at the events this year around the globe. Uh, you can see that adaptation is extremely important. Last point I would make on the educational issue. Uh, again, Kamal Dervish made a point, which I thought was a very good one. He said, you know, technology is moving so quickly that five years from now you will recognize the world today. There will be so many changes taking place. That says to me, how do we educate our university students? I'm at a, I was on a committee at McGill, like these are freshmen. How are they going to be training for jobs which don't yet exist? Uh, and and uh, that's, this requires a lot of thought, a lot of study, and a lot of analysis, something I would like to see the World, the world Policy Forum take on because it's one of the most important issues in the 21st century, uh, not just for the United States which also, by the way, has a dearth of engineers, which is another problem that I was reading about, that there are companies that cannot get the necessary qualified engineers within the United States. So they need migration, and they're having trouble getting some people out of the country. That was in the New York Times, I think, uh, this last week. So that's a real challenge. I'll leave it with that. Those are the five points. None of them make me very optimistic, uh, but there it is. <laughs>